Hi friends, thanks for joining me for Organic True Crime with Sydney Hopes, where I talk about interesting true crime and general spooky stories. So if you're interested in either of those, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Today, we're going to be talking about a really fun one that you've probably heard of, but probably don't know the real story. Um, if you've seen the movie Catch Me If You Can with Leonardo DiCaprio, this is about Frank Abagnale Jr. Um, we're going to talk about how that movie was sold as, well, it's based on a book that was sold as a true story, but the truth is not exactly what you think it is. <laughs> so first I'm going to tell you the story behind the movie and the book, the story that most people know, and then after that I'm going to tell you how much of that is actually true, <laughs> and it's probably not as much as you think it is, seeing as it says based on the true story. So Frank Abagnale Jr. He was born in April of 1948 to Frank Abagnale Sr. and Paulette Abagnale. He was one of four children. He was the second. He had an older sister and then two younger brothers. Um, and the way the story is told, he grew up with his mother and father. His dad owned a stationery shop, stationery store in New York City. They lived outside of the city. Um, but all of the children helped out at the store, like most family businesses, I assume, I don't actually know. Um, but all the children did help out with the family stationery store. And Frank Jr. got really well acquainted with the city because he ran deliveries for the store. Just keep that in mind. Um, so when he was 16 years old, one day he is in school when suddenly someone comes and pulls him out of class and tells him that he has to come with them and takes him out of school to a courtroom where he is told his parents are getting a divorce and he right this very second needs to choose if he's going to live with his mom or his dad. So being a 16 year old, this is a lot of pressure to put on a person. Instead of deciding, he runs away to New York City. And this is the last time that he ever sees his father was in that courtroom and the last time that he sees his mother for a long time. I think it's like seven years that he says he goes without seeing her after this. Um, but he, like I said, knew the city really well from doing all of his deliveries, so that's where he went to at first. And he didn't have any money as a 16-year-old kid, so his solution was to write fake checks and cash fake checks to get money. But this was not a very solid solution. It's not exactly reliable to be able to get away with cashing fake checks. So he is looking for a new idea, and one day, while in the city, he sees a pilot and his flight crew walking into a hotel and he starts thinking, it'd probably be pretty easy to cash an out of town check if you were a pilot, because pilots are pretty respectable and banks probably wouldn't question him that much, especially if it was out of town and they don't really know what it's supposed to look like. And he's a pilot, so it makes sense for him to be out of town trying to cash this check, right? So. He starts cooking up a plan and he thinks, I need a pilot's uniform so that people will think that I am a real pilot. And he chooses Pan American Airlines. He says, uh, Frank Jr. says that he chose Pan American Airlines because it's a very, it was a very large um, airline at the time. It was really popular, so he thought they probably wouldn't notice if he was stealing a little bit of money from him. He could go under the radar if it was just a little bit because it's such a large company, they wouldn't know. So he calls. So Frank Jr. calls the corporate office of Pan American and he tells them that he is a pilot out of San Francisco, has been for seven years. He's had an overnight at New York in New York City and he sent his pilot's uniform out to the hotel laundry to have it washed and they lost it. And he has another flight to get to later today so he needs a uniform now so that he's not late for his flight. And they say, okay sir, we'll give you the name of a tailor in town that provides our uniforms um, and they send him to well-built uniform company in New York City and he goes and explains his whole story and they say okay and they fit him for his pilot uniform and they ask him after he's gotten it all fitted are you gonna pay for cash or do you want to just take this out of your check and Frank Jr. saying yeah sure I'll take it out of my check and they're like okay just write down your employee ID number and we'll just charge it to your account. It's like, 
okay, I, I can do that. He just writes down some number that he came up with and they take it and there you go. He walks out with his brand new Pan American pilot's uniform. So then he goes to the airport and he just watches. He sees the employees coming in and out and he sees that they all go to a different entrance and they show a badge and then they get let through. So our crafty Mr. Frank Jr. finds out who makes Pan American IDs and he goes to this company and he tells them that he's starting his own company and he wants to have formal IDs for his employees and he really likes the layout of Pan American IDs. So he, he asks them for a sample so that he can take it back and decide if that is the format that he really likes. And they say, okay. So they take his picture and put it on a sample Pan American ID. Doesn't have the logo on it or anything. It's just the same format. And they left the uh, company name blank because it's a new company. He hasn't started it yet. And it's just a sample. So then he goes and buys a model Pan American airplane. And they do actually show this in the movie. I think they just use it for checks in the movie, not for the ID, but I don't remember. It's been a while since I've seen it. Anyway, he buys a model airplane and he uses the little label that comes on the model airplane to put onto his sample ID and make it look like an actual Pan American pilot's ID. So after all of Frank's studying of the airport, he knows to walk into the airport and go to the operations entrance of an airline that isn't Pan American Airlines because they would probably be very familiar with a Pan American ID and would notice that this one looks a little funny. So he goes to a different airline and he shows his ID and he asks for an available jump seat. A jump seat is an extra seat that's usually in the cockpit and it's usually reserved for fellow pilots. And Frank figured this out and he knew that pilots can fly for free on other airlines to get to wherever they need to be for their next flight if it's not out of the airline that they're in now. So he starts just kind of hanging out around pilots and listening and getting used to the jargon that they use. And he said that the way that he would get away with not knowing that much about flying is whatever plane he was on, they would always ask pilots just as their casual conversation, they would ask him what kind of plane he flew. And he would just say one that wasn't the one that he was on so that if he didn't know anything about this plane that they were on, he's like, yeah, this, these aren't the kind that I fly. You know, he's very good at tricking people at, at talking and charming his way into situations and people believe him. He knows how to avoid certain subjects and how to pick up on the way that people talk and mirror them so that they trust him more, especially in this kind of situation. So as the story goes, for the next two years from ages 16 to 18, he flew more than a million miles for free pretending to be a pilot and he stole about $2.5 million in fake paychecks from Pan American Airlines. But after two years of this, it starts getting a little sketchy. It's again, not a very solid plan. <laughs> you can't always rely on getting away with this. So he decides to come up with something else. He's like, all right, I'm, I'm done being a pilot. I'm gonna move on. So next, Frank Jr. decides that he wants to be a doctor. Why not? You've been a pilot, let's be a doctor. So he moves to Georgia and starts living in a, in a part. He moves to Georgia into an, an, why is this so hard for me to say? He moves into an apartment building. Ha, ah, did it. <laughs> and one of his neighbors in this complex is a doctor. So he starts getting all buddy buddy with this neighbor and he convinces him. He convinces his neighbor that he has a medical degree and that he'd really be interesting, interested in shadowing this doctor neighbor. And the guy's like, yeah, sure, you can come in and shadow me, whatever. So he does, and through this, he gains access of the medical library. And he uses his access to the medical library to learn enough to seem like he is a doctor. And apparently, he does well enough to get himself a job because he ends up getting a job overseeing the interns during the night shift at a hospital. But after about a year of doing this, he realizes that he is not gonna be able to get away with being a doctor for very long because he does not know 
anything about being a doctor. He has, has not gone to medical school. This is probably not a good idea. So he decides to move on to the next thing. And he's like, you know what? I think I want to be a lawyer. Why not? Got pilot, got doctor. Let's be a lawyer. Go through all your little kid dreams. That's uh, jobs, right? <laughs> so he moves to Louisiana. And he finds himself someone who has a connection with the DA's office. And he tells this woman that he has a Harvard law degree and he's looking for a job. So she tells her buddy at the DA's office, like, hey, I've got this young man who went to Harvard and wants to be a lawyer. And they're like, yeah, okay, man, come work with us. So he gets a job at the DA's office in Louisiana. <laughs> so in order to become a lawyer, you have to pass the bar in whatever state that you're in. And Frank says that he took it three times and passed it on his third try. In the movie, they make a whole big thing out of how did you pass the bar? How did you cheat on this? And eventually he just says, I didn't. I just did it. And that's how the story goes. After three tries, he figured it out and he passed it without having an actual Harvard Law degree. And during his time working for the DA's office, he wins 33 cases. Again, without an actual law degree. But... He had a fellow co-worker that actually did go to Harvard and he started getting a little suspicious because Frank can, talk, Frank can talk his way in and out of situations pretty well, but you can only hold on to that without actual information actually gone to the school for so long. So again, after about a year, he decides it's getting a little sketchy in this situation. So he's gonna move on. Hands up, is that? So he moves to Provo, Utah and gets a job as a professor for Brigham Young University. At this point, he's about 19 years old, but he's been lying and saying that he was born in 1938 instead of 1948, so they think he's almost 30, but he's not. He's 19, and he is a sociology professor at Brigham Young University. He had told the dean that before he was a pilot, he was a teacher, and teaching is his true love, and he really just wants to go back to being that. So he did tell them he was a pilot. I don't think he told them about his time as a doctor and a lawyer, because it's hard to go through that amount of school and be the age that you are and have the amount of experience that you do. People might question that. During his time at Brigham Young University, Frank becomes everyone's favorite teacher. He's the favorite class. It's sociology class. is everyone's favorite. Everyone loves him. He's a great professor. But after about a year, he starts getting scared that he's going to get caught for the fact that he's not really a professor. He does not actually have the qualifications to be teaching people in college. He never even went to college. He's only 19 at this point. So he quits that job. And he moves to Massachusetts, where for... I think just one time he says that he put on a, a security uniform and he stood in front of an ATM and he held a little sign that said it was out of order and he would tell people, I'll just take your money instead because our ATM is broken and we'll just deposit it for you. And apparently this worked. I can't imagine coming up to that and being like, okay, yeah, that sounds right. Here, have my money. But anyway, he gets it to work and he puts it into a, he's got a safety deposit box saying, being like, see, look, I've got this safe deposit box. You can just, is it safety or safe? Anyway, it's like a little safe, <laughs> right? So he puts all their money in there and he somehow convinces two actual Massachusetts police officers to help him carry this safe deposit box, safety, safe, I think it's safe deposit box, to his car. That is Obviously not a solid thing, and I think he only did it once and knew that he would not get away with that again. But at this point in his life, he's 20 years old, and Frank decides he needs to go clean. He needs to live a normal life, have a real job, but he can't do it in America because he's scammed so many people in America. In Amer in, he's scammed so many people in America that he's probably on some radars. So he decides to move to France and live his clean life in France. But it turns out it's kind of hard to do that. So it did not last very long. He had a hard time getting a job in France. So he starts his old game again and starts writing bad checks. But he goes to Switzerland to cash them most of the time. He did still cash some fake checks in France. But in Switzerland, they notice it. And they also notice that he's cashing these checks in Switzerland and then going back to France and living there. 
So, Swiss police, Swiss officials put out an Interpol warrant for Frank Abagnale Jr. And the French was eventually arrested for the first time in his whole life in France. But when they arrested him, they realized that he was also committing fraud in France. So he needed to serve a sentence with them before they would send him to Switzerland to serve his sentence for fraud in Switzerland. So 20 year old Frank is sent to the house of arrest, which is known for being horrible and just having terrible conditions at this time. Um, he serves a sentence of six months there. And in his time, of six months there he he lost about 89 pounds he said he suffered from horrible conditions he was not doing well he was very ill in the movie they show him as being very very ill by the time he was done with his sentence in france and then they sent him to switzerland to serve his time there which it does not say i don't where he had normal conditions in switzerland and then he was handed over to the FBI because he was wanted in America. So at, eight, so, so at 23 years old, Frank Abagnale Jr. is handed over to the FBI and they take him back to the US so that he can answer for his crimes that he committed there from ages 16 to 20. But he escaped on the plane back He escaped from the plane when they landed in America. I have heard him tell this two different ways. Um, I think it's it might just be because the movie the movie showed him crawling out of a toilet and somehow escaping from the plane that way and running down the tarmac and catching a cab and going to wherever he was hiding. But um, when Frank speaks about it now, I think he says that he escaped through the kitchen galley. Which I don't really know what that means on a plane, so I don't know. Either the bathroom or the kitchen, not that important. Fact is, he escaped from the plane. He escaped from the FBI. He ran away and caught a cab and went to a... But he was eventually recaptured. I don't think it took them very long to recapture him because he didn't leave the city or anything. Um... So he was captured and he was sent to the Atlanta Penitentiary to serve a sentence of 12 years. But Frank did not like this. He didn't like his time in jail at the Atlanta Penitentiary. That's hard to say. <laughs> so he has a friend, a lady friend of his, somehow make a fake FBI badge and bring it to him during a visit. And he uses this fake FBI badge to say that he is a federal prison inspector and convinces the guards that he is there to inspect their prison. And he uses this to escape from the Atlanta penitentiary. Now at this time, he was the only person to have ever escaped this specific prison. So he fled from Georgia to back to New York City where he lived for one month before he was recaptured outside of the Waldorf Hotel. Yes, the Waldorf Hotel. After this, he served for four of his 12 years when after four years, the FBI approached him and offered him a deal. And they said if he would work for them and help them stop people from doing the things that he did, then he could serve out his sentence just working for them and being on probation and not actually have to be in jail. So he agreed and he was released from prison and worked for the FBI as a consultant for the rest, for the remainder of his sentence. Eight years, I can do quick math. <laughs> anyway, um, so after these eight years, he did eventually, maybe not right after, I don't know when, he did eventually open his own consulting firm and he continued to do this kind of work for the remainder of his career. He's now in his seventies and I don't think he's still consulting. Mm -hmm. And they did make good stories. It's an interesting story. It's fun to listen to, but it is not true. <laughs> so now let's talk about what actually happened with Frank Abagnale Jr. So Frank Abagnale Jr. really was born in 1948 to Frank Abagnale Sr. and Paulette Abagnale. He was one of four children. 
his dad did own a stationary shop and he did help out in it along with his siblings. And that's about it for the truth of our last story. <laughs> There's a little bit more later, but. So his sudden, his parents' sudden divorce where he was pulled out of school and told right then and there he had to choose didn't happen. Uh, in 1960, when Frank was 12 years old, his parents separated, and then three years later, they eventually got divorced. It was not a surprise. And he lived with his dad the whole time. He was always closer with his dad, and he was given the option, and he did live with them. I'm not sure about his siblings. I couldn't really find where they grew up, but I do know that Frank was with his dad. <clears throat> When Frank Jr. was 16 years old, he lied about his age and joined the Navy because you had to be 17 at the time to sign up, and he somehow was able to lie and get in. While he was in the Navy, his dad gave him a gas card, a credit card, just for a gas station, and he would use this card to buy car parts, and then he would return them later for cash, and that's how he had spending money, he stole it from his dad. Um, after three months of being in the Navy, he was discharged. And a few days later, he was arrested for forgery in New York City. So he was arrested lots more than one time. He claims to have only ever been arrested one time in France when he was 20, after, there were lots of times, <laughs> starting when he was 16. Or I think he might have, starting when he was a teenager. He was able to bail himself out when he was arrested in New York and he ran away to California as soon as he bailed himself out. He, he got to California by stealing a yellow Mustang and he got himself some spending money by going to an auto parts store and asking the employee there for something in the back or somehow getting him distracted and sending him to the back and he leaned over the counter and he grabbed their checkbook and he wrote himself a check and then he left and he cashed that check from this auto parts, uh, auto parts store and that was how he had his spending money to California. Okay if everything looked slightly different than it did a second ago my whole setup just fell over and I had to redo it. Where was I? Right. So, Frank is in California staying in a hotel, and he tells them at the front desk that he is a U.S. federal employee, and he should have a discount on his room. Now, he is 17 years old, obviously lying about his age, but he looks like a 17-year-old, and the front desk employee was like, that seems a little sketchy, and decided to call the authorities, and he was arrested for impersonating a federal employee just to get a discount on his hotel room. And somehow, since he uh, had run away from his, since he had run away from New York and missed his court date, he did still have to go back to New York to face his crimes that he committed there. So somehow, police officials in California made a deal with Frank's father for him to transport him back to New York and then take him to court, that seems crazy to me, like transporting a prisoner, his dad transporting a prisoner, or I guess, that seems a little strange to me because maybe that's normal, I don't know. Anyway, so Frank's dad comes to California and takes him back to New York. He does take him to his first court hearing, but he has a secondary hearing that he does not show up to. Turns out, Frank Jr. didn't show up to his secondary court hearing because he had been arrested in a different county. So in a different county in New York, don't know what county, but somewhere else in New York State, <clears throat> Frank Jr. did actually get a pilot's uniform I'm not sure how he got it, but he did get his hands on a pilot's uniform and he took it to a tailor 
and at the Taylors, they got a little suspicious. They didn't really believe the story he was telling. And again, he's 17 years old. Most pilots don't look that young. So they called police and he was arrested there for impersonating a pilot. And because of his, for his multiple crimes in New York, he was eventually sentenced to three years in jail. Um, he only served two before being released. A few months after Frank Jr. was released from jail in New York, he was arrested again, this time in Boston for forgery. Um, and he served one year, he served one year in jail in Boston. And he was released in 1968. In 1969, Frank again did impersonate a pilot this time using his uniform. He actually was able to get a free flight to Miami. I think that's the only time he actually used the pilot's uniform to get a free flight. Did not do it for two years and did not steal 2.5 million from Pan American Air. Pan Am has actually come out and said that they he did steal from them, but it was such a minuscule amount that he was on their radar, but they didn't do anything. They weren't actually that worried about him. So he did get this one free flight to Miami. And on this flight, he met a stewardess and he fell for this stewardess immediately. So he decided to take out all the whole flight crew, not the pilots, just the stewardesses, to dinner once they landed in Miami. And after this dinner, he sent that specific stewardess um, roses and chocolates. And this kind of creeped her out and she didn't really respond to it. So what does Frank do? He convinces an employee, she worked for Delta Airlines, so he convinces a Delta Airlines employee to share her flight. So he knew where she was gonna land. He went to this airport, it was in her hometown, and he waited for her. So she lands, is leaving the airport to go home, and sees Frank out there and he says, oh hey, Funny meeting you here. My flight just got canceled. Would you want to hang out? And she says, no, thank you. Because this really creeped her out that he was just there. And Frank actually did this three more times. Before finally she agreed to let him drive her home. She agreed to let him give her a ride. And somehow... He gives her a ride to, his, to her home and he weasels his way into her house. She lives with her whole family, her parents and I think siblings, there's a whole family there. And he just charms his little way into this family so much so that he moves into the home for a brief period. So Frank Jr. is living with the family of this stewardess that he stalked for a bit and after not a very long time, I think it was like three months, after a short amount of time, the family starts getting suspicious of him and they think that he's been stealing from them. So they report him to the police. He had in fact been stealing from them. So he is arrested. But during his time with the family, he met one of their close family friends who was also a local reverend. And he convinced this man to speak for him in in court to be like a character witness for him and the reverend does he and i think he actually gets a few other people from the area to also speak about him and frank jr was still sentenced to 12 years because of his crimes but because of the reverend and all the other people that spoke about him and said they said how great of a person he is and how he deserves a chance because of that, he is allowed to carry out his 12-year sentence on probation. He ran away from this. He did not stay and serve probation for 12 years. No. Frank Jr. instead, Frank Jr. instead ran away to Switzerland. While there, he used his same old tricks to con people out of shelter and money, just staying places for free and stealing money from people. He did eventually also steal a car and he used that car to drive himself to France. 
And in France, he was arrested, like he says in his story. He was sentenced to three months. He was not at the house of arrest. He did not have horrible conditions, and he did not lose 89 pounds in his few months in a French prison. Doctors have actually said that that is impossible for the amount of time that he was in prison, that he would have actually died. He can't lose that amount of weight in that amount of time. Anyhow. In 1970, he was sent from France to Switzerland to serve out his to serve his sentence there. And then after that, he was released. Oh. He said he he served two months in Switzerland, and then they released him, but they also banned him from Switzerland for one year. And the FBI was not looking for him. He had not committed that many crazy crimes in America, so he was just released. And when he was 22 years old, Frank Jr. was arrested again, this time in Georgia. Because of his previous record, Frank Jr. was sentenced to 10 years in jail at Cobb County Jail in Georgia. But he actually escaped during processing when the guards had their backs turned. Just ran away. Four days later, he was arrested again. And the way that they caught him is actually kind of fun. Apparently, one of the police officers saw him just out and about in the area, and he was pretty sure that this was Frank, the guy that they were looking for. So he just went, hey, Frank, and he turned around. And I was like, oh, darn. Got caught again four days later. <laughs> it's not so dumb. Anyway, he was released, but he pretty much just kept on his same old habits of stealing and getting in trouble until he got a probation officer that was really dedicated to helping him change and he helped give him the idea of being a consultant and using his brains for crimes to stop crimes instead. Did that make any sense? Using his experience to stop future crimes? Maybe that? I don't know. You get it. So he did actually have a consulting firm. He really does or did consult for crimes in that way, but we don't know if he ever worked through the FBI. The FBI has never confirmed nor denied that Frank ever worked with them to help prevent crimes. So we don't really know. He did have the consulting firm though. And he's also done lots of TED Talks and talked about himself and his fake story that did so well. And the thing that really gets me about this is People found out the truth pretty early on after the book was released, before even the movie, and nobody cared at all. Like, people came out and called him out on all of his lies and said, like, you're selling this as a true story and it's not. And nobody cared because his story is a better story. It's fun. I don't know. It's more interesting. So he just keeps on living his life, telling the story and making all this money, and it's not true at all. And nobody cares. It really gets me. But anyway, and there's tons of proof too. So during the time that he says he was a professor at um, Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, I remembered it, um, there's this picture of him that he uses him at a desk looking like a professor. And you can see in the picture that there's a Dr. Pibb on his desk. Dr. Pibb was not released until 1972, which is four years after Frank claims to be a professor. So, how are you sitting at your professor desk with the soda that doesn't exist until four years later? He also, remember how he claimed to have taken the bar three times in Louisiana and passed it? He says that he took it three times in 13 weeks. That is impossible. They only give out the bar every six months. So if you were to take it three times, it would have taken him a year and a half, not 13 weeks. So there's a lot of things like that that make it very obvious that he was not telling the truth, but just nobody cares and he keeps just making his money. And the movie is a good movie. I liked it. It's a fun story, but it is not a true story like they say that it is. So that, my friends, is Frank Avignale Jr. He's real something. He really, truly is a scam artist. He conned us all into thinking that he was telling a true story for a long time. But it really wasn't that long. It just got ignored. He's a better storyteller, I guess. I don't know. I really don't know how everyone just ignored the fact that he's 
just making it all up. And also his stories change a little bit from <laughs> different times he tells it. Like I've watched several different interviews with him and times that he's telling the story and details do change. It's a little hard to get exactly the right story because it didn't actually happen. So there isn't exactly the right story. But if you have heard any different versions or know any other details that I didn't mention or if I got anything wrong, please let me know. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed today's story. Thanks so much for joining me and I'll be back in a few days with another one. So see you then. Bye.